get right back into, into cascade control. Let's just warm up a little bit. What's the purpose of cascade control? <coughs> Disturbance rejection, where is that disturbance entry? Relative to the control variable. In the inner loop, okay? So this disturbance coming in, if left unchecked, it's going to propagate through the process and meet our primary variable that we're controlling. And then it's going to take a while to remove that disturbance. Okay? So it's the, the problem why we're dealing with it. Cascade control is because these disturbances take a while to eliminate. Okay, so the key criteria for cascade control is whenever you've got a disturbance that leads to unacceptable performance, we look at cascade control as one option. Okay? We're also going to look in today's class at feed forward control. This is a new type of controller we're going to consider. So let's just wrap up cascade control first and understand. We implement cascade control with an unacceptable behavior. So to mitigate that problem, we need a measured variable that we call our secondary variable. And last Friday, we spent considerable time identifying a procedure how to isolate a suitable secondary variable. So that was our goal on Friday. What's a suitable secondary variable? Well, there's some criteria that that secondary variable must indicate a disturbance. Okay? The secondary variable doesn't necessarily is the disturbance. The secondary variable simply indicates the disturbance. And there needs to be a cause and effect relationship from the valve to that secondary variable. So we must be able to change that secondary variable in some way. And as we'll see in today's class, we need a faster response. Otherwise, there's no point in doing this. So let's take a look at the final example we ended up with on Friday. Um, we were considering the system where we've got a packed bed reactor. The reaction taking place in there is exothermic, and if we increase the temperature in that packed bed, T3, we drive our kinetics to be a little faster, we convert our raw material to a greater extent. When we get higher conversion of our raw material, this purity leaving here drops. Okay? So remember the cause and effect mechanism was we increase T3, higher temperature, faster kinetics, higher conversion, this concentration of the reactant, in other words, the heat material, is greater, so AC will drop. So that was what we looked at on Friday. Take a minute, and I'd like you to draw the block diagram, so the process control block diagram for the system. As I've emphasized several times in this class, a good and important skill that we need is being able to take this diagram and begin in our PNID diagrams and draw a block flow diagram. Okay, so the starting point is obviously our primary variable. So we start here with the CV control variable, and we work all the way back to the beginning to our set point. Okay. So I'll give you two, three minutes and fill in the rest of the detail. Okay, so that's the set point for AC1 and our control variable in AC1.
function is the description of what happens when I change the valve opening to what's the signal coming out of the process here? T3. T3. Okay. So several of you mentioned that T3, that's the output from that process transfer function. It's describing what happens when I open and close that valve on this temperature over here. Remember that it's this temperature T3, that's your secondary variable. over here, we always find our secondary variable. And T3 is then what we measure and feedback in our inner loop. Now, in this example though, T3 is affected by our main disturbance. So let's add that in here. Our disturbance coming in is in fact T2. T2 is the disturbance that that's the reason why we're building this whole cascade control system in this example, is because T2 is a temperature that varies the temperature of that steam. So here's some disturbance GD that impacts T3, and so my complete measurement of T3 is actually on this side of the summation. So this block here, GP2, tells me how T3 changes with the valve. This block, GD, tells me how T3 changes when T2 changes. 
The composite of them gives me T3, and T3 then is the block that finally goes here, that's GP1. When T3 changes, that's my input over here, it's telling me what the effect is on purity for these. Let's take a minute and think a little bit more about this problem. What is the sign of the gain in this block GP1? Sign of the gain in GP1. Negative. If T3 increases, we get higher reaction rates, faster kinetics, more conversion of our raw material, so AC1 drops. AC1 is the purity or the concentration of the reactants of our feed. So if T3 goes up, that purity drops. So there's a negative gain in GP1. What is the gain in GP2? So we've got a positive gain here, and we've got a negative gain over there. What is the dynamics? Remember we had said one of the key criteria in cascade control is the inner loop must have faster dynamics than the primary loop. Let's talk about dynamics. What do we know about dynamics? How do we quantify faster dynamics and slower dynamics? Time constant. Okay. So, the time constant, what do you think would be the time constant in this case between the valve opening and CT3 changing? Those are those dynamics over here. And we're comparing this dynamics relative to this dynamic. This block GP1 dynamics, that's telling me what is the dynamics when T3 changes and then I see a response out of AC1. Do we satisfy that criteria of faster dynamics in the inner loop relative to the outer loop in this example? So, no one over there on that side of the class, all still sleeping. It's Monday. The beginning of the week is going to be a long week. The dynamics, T3 to AC1, faster or slower than the dynamics in the inner loop? I need an answer. Yeah? Any idea? Any guess? What's your intuition on the dynamics? If I open that valve, how long is it going to be before I see a change in T3? Uh, okay. We make a change, it just moves through the heat exchanger and quite quickly we can see a change in T3. The change in T3 though, out to AC1, that can take a long time. The material has to move through that pack bed reactor. This analyzer AC1 may have some time delay in it as well. Okay, so let's take a look then at that and look now next how to tune this controller. I left you with this question on Friday. How do we go about tuning this control system. We've got two things we need to do here as control engineers. We need to figure out the controller tuning for GC1 and GC2. <coughs> Let's take a look at GC2. GC2 is the controller on the inner loop, and I just realized I haven't actually closed the loop here, so let's, let's close up that loop. So let's focus on GC2 and GC1. The controller tuning process in cascade control is we tune our inner loop first with the outer loop open. So let's make a note of that. So we got that clear. Tuning proceeds by opening the outer loop. So open the outer loop. and tune the inner loop first. Mm -hmm. 
let's think back about our controller tuning process. If we say we're going to tune the inner loop, how are we going to do that specifically? What exact procedure are you going to follow as the control engineer to tune the inner loop? See current tuning rules, what do you need? What do you need to do? Okay, so Mark says a step, a step where? say tuning the inner loop simply visually deletes the outer loop and what do you have left behind? So tuning the inner loop says simply just ignore all of this stuff here on the outside and focus on the inner loop. Think back to how we tune control systems then, what did we do? You're right Mark that there's a step input but where is that step? Step input there. How do we tune control systems? Yeah, we always make a step change in the manipulator group. Okay. So where do we put a step input? Okay. So let's put a step input over here. And what do I observe? What do I measure? Think back to the example of the midterm. The operator made a change to the valve. What did we measure? The control variable, which is T3. Okay. So we're going to make a step here at the set opening, and we're going to observe what happens to T3. So T3 is going to do something like that. And once we do that, make that step, we're going to get the process gain process time constant and the process time delay for GP2. Okay, so essentially what we need is we would like a first order plus time delay model for GP2. That's going to be our first open the outer loop and tune the inner loop using the model for GP2 equal to K to E to the minus theta 2 plus. <coughs> Okay. Using the model for that and, and the tuning rules in C and C. Okay, let's demonstrate that here with a simulated example. So there's my process. loop is we take this feedback controller in the outer loop and simply remove it. We open up that loop so that that feedback controller that goes there, this GC1, we simply break it away. And we're going to do a, make a step input right there at the process valve and measure T3. So let's go Measure T3 by putting a step input over there. So let's run that, create a step input and we get our first order response back to the So that's just going to be a KP, a tau, time constant, and a time delay. In fact, we're going to get 0.6 for my gain, 20 for the time constant, and whatever the value is for the delay. We can go to our CM Cohen tuning rules, and in this example, you can, um, you can try it using those values at home, the time delay, if you want to try it out yourself, was 8 units. So KP for this process over here is equal to 0.6 e to the minus 8s over 20s plus 1. And the KC that you get and the TI that you get from the CN Confucian rules are 2.0 and 22. Okay. 
So that's your first step. So I'm going to put that PI controller in over there with that KC and with that TI. The next step that you do is you then close the inner loop. As I've just done there for you, I've closed my inner loop. Now I have a complete inner loop here. And we tune our outer loop. What exactly will you go and do to tune the outer loop this time? So Mark's going to say make a step. Where do we make our step? change at the set point for TC3. So let's go put that in over there. And this time we identify again a controller, sorry, we identify a transfer function model that's first order plus delta. So close the inner loop and tune the outer loop using a first order plus time delay model. from the primary variable, so my primary variable is A1, to the set point of the inner loop. So the first order of this time delay model is an output over an input. The output is equal to the primary variable. And the input is equal to the set point of the inner loop. Those of you that are in the back and can't read that, it's a little bit low down here on the board. The first order of this time delay model has its output, which is the primary variable, AC1 in this example. And the input in the denominator is the set point of the inner loop. We're going to build the first order plus time delay model from this set point all the way to that point. Um, so what happens? You tune the inner loop first, but the process is disconnected. So this, this controller that's normally over here gets removed. So you don't do this for a long time, because you normally have the loop there for safety reasons or product quality reasons. So when you're tuning, you, you quickly tune it, do your step response, and then close it back up. OK, so when I make the step change now, I'm going to see some sort of behavior in that inner loop. So now my step input is over there, my output is over there. And I'm estimating a first order plus time delay model over that entire region. Okay, if you do that estimate, you can try it that's yourself. I'll post the simulator file for you to try it as well. But you get that GP for the outer loop. That's a, a process transfer function that simulates the entire outer loop is equal to minus 0.2 e to the minus 35s. So you have 35 units of time delay, approximately, divided by 51s plus 1. OK, 
Okay, and then KC and TI for this of from the tables that you can read off is minus 4.75 for KC and TI for the outer loop is equal to 60. here to a single block. People that were in Friday's tutorial, you already proved that to yourself. But essentially what we're doing is we're putting in a step input here and observing what happens with this feedback controller built in and this process in series. So you have to two blocks in series. So that's why this yellow line looks like a second order transfer function. So you see that it's slowed, then there, and then it settles out. Okay, so that's the process for a cascade loop. Is we tune our inner loop first and then we tune our outer loop, outer loop. Then you can go and put those two, two feedback controllers in. I've, I've done that over here. I've got my outer loop, my inner loop, and I've got my disturbance. And we can go simulate and fine tune it. So I'm going to show you that simulation in a second. Just to point out here, the dynamics of the inner loop the time constant on the inner loop is 20 units, the time constant on the outer loop is 50 units. There's that criteria that the inner loop needs to be made that much faster than the outer loop. We see that there in the time constant. So when we observe this process with that tuning that we've just calculated, um, you can go run the control system and there's a bit of detail here, but let's just take a look at it. Essentially the blue line is the one that you're interested in. That's this AC1. We notice that AC1 barely moves. When that disturbance comes and impacts by process, the disturbance is the yellow curve. The purity stays almost the same. So this control loop is doing exactly what it should do. So T3 is my disturbance. It comes in. Purity barely moves. But my valve, however, moves to compensate for that. Without the purity. Um, isn't the disturbance T2 though? The disturbance, oh, sorry, disturbance is T2, but it, it changes T2. So what I've shown there, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, thanks for picking up. Uh, what I've shown you here is that line over there. So it comes through the disturbance, and I'm showing you what the effect is of love. So it's how the additional impact on T3 is. OK, so I'll post these simulate diagrams. Um, my expectation is that you go Go mess around with them, try different controller tunings, try repeating that tuning process I just showed you on the home slide. Okay, this is not something I can put in an assignment for you because there's no way to, to show your work. It's, it's so so many cumulative steps that I'm simply just giving you the tools and I'm expecting you to do it in your own time to, to get some practice. Okay, any questions on cascade control before we move on? I think we, we've covered this fairly, fairly well, and I'm glad we have because it's one of the most frequently seen control systems, apart from just regular PI control. So I'd like to just go back there and finish up the slides here. We looked at this uh, last, last class on Friday. We, we evaluated the performance for cascade control relative to regular feedback. Okay, so we've covered that for a I just want to also end up by um, essentially by pointing out that cascade control doesn't have to stop at two levels. Here we've got a cascade of an inner loop and an outer loop. But we can cascade a third level, a fourth level, any number of levels can be cascaded into each other. So here's a three level cascade indicated on the same example. So my outer loop is AC1, my inner loop, my first inner loop is down to TC3. 
And then TC3 last time, we had it controlling the valve directly. But what we could do is cascade it to the flow rate and the flow rate control the valve. So here's a three level cascade indicated for you. And you can go any number of levels provided every, each level, interior level, meets the criteria of the, of the cascade rules that we had earlier. Okay. In fact, one way that you, you may, you will see cascade is with uh, valves. So almost all valves in practice are implemented in some sort of cascade. When you tell this control system to manipulate the valve, that valve itself is, is a mini cascade, probably even without you realizing it. Um, what we call this is a valve position, and here's what it looks like in practice. Uh, there's, a, there's an actual valve positioner over here, there's a diagram, and essentially what the valve positioner does is when the signal comes to the valve and says you need to open, say, to 47%, there's no way that the valve actually gets exactly to 47%. What the valve positioner does is it looks at scale from 0 to 100 and sees where the valve is and with a very small and very fast feedback loop over here it adjusts the air pressure to make sure that it actually reaches that 47 percent. So when that signal comes into the valve, in fact the signal is giving a new set point for the valve and then the air pressure is a manipulated variable on that inner cascade loop to get the valve to the correct position. So there's there's, you'll almost certainly always see cascade in that, in that manner on the control valve. Okay, so that's pretty much all there is for cascade control. I'm going to leave it at that point and we'll move on to the second handout that we had in front of you this morning. That looks at these forward. comes in a certain flow and we're manipulating the flow rate through the valve position in order to control the outlet temperature TC2. Now there's a number of disturbances that, that come into this process. The one we considered last time with casket control was the disturbance in the pressure of the heat stream. Do you remember that? It said that the pressure will affect the flow, the flow will affect the heat transfer which affects T2. And the cascade loop was really effective because we could eliminate that pressure variation really early on before it, it hits TC2. With feed forward control, I'm going to consider a different disturbance. Let's consider the disturbance when the feed temperature changes. So the feed temperature coming into the tank drops. What's going to happen to TC2? Up there. TC2 drops, okay, so your feed temperature drops, TC2 will drop, and TC2 will then call the valve to open up to let more steam in. That steam effect kicks in a while later, and TC2 rises back up to where it should be, the red, that one set point. In the meantime, however, that drop has been enough to go below the level of acceptable valve where we want to control this. So T1 drops, we can measure T1. We know that this disturbance is going to come through and hit my output, my primary variable TC2. Can we use cascade on this? Not necessarily cascade how we looked at it last time. We, we cascaded TC2 over to F. Remember, it was last week's class. Can we cascade TC2 onto T1? Well, let's take a look at the cascade criteria. Let's consider if T1 was my secondary variable, let's work through the steps of the 
In fact, I'll let you work through it. Consider those five criteria. Assume, obviously, that number one is, is unacceptable, so that's true. Are, are criteria two, three, four, and five, do we have guesses for those? So work with the person next to you, talk about whether they're yes or no. Measurable. There's no, no way we can 
we feed forward on a disturbance we don't measure. So we measure that disturbance T1, and it's a step down. Let's presume it's a step down here in green. And if that disturbance was allowed to continue with taking no change on the valve, so simply assume that I leave the valve on the steam exactly where it is, the temperature T at the outlet will drop by that amount. So there's a bit of time delay, but it drops in the first order manner in that, in that root curve. What we're saying is, let's put in the opposite the exact mirror image of that disturbance effect incline so that the two, the sum of them, cancel each other out. So the blue line is what the effect of the disturbance would be with no control action. The pink line is the effect when we take action without now, so that we, the net sum of them gets you a flat line. In other words, T barely moves. And the valve action we would need to take is what's shown here in black. So we're going to put that input into the valve. Notice we put that input in preemptively so that that, that line stays flat. Okay, so that's the principle of feed forward control. Let's uh, take a look at it on a block diagram. On a block diagram, here's the variable that I'm interested in controlling. And what we're saying is that that controlled variable is affected by my disturbance. The disturbance transfer function is GD, and here is that disturbance. So this disturbance will come in and sh serve to shift CB up or down. So it's going to move my CB away from where I, where I am. My regular process is over here. There's the manipulated variable that comes into my process. And what we're saying is, let's measure this disturbance, put it through the feed forward controller, that GFM, that transfer function will derive in a minute, and we're going to take some action on the manipulated variable so that the summation leads to a signal that has a net of zero. Let's perhaps draw this in the context of a regular feedback diagram so you can see the feed forward. start with the regular feedback controller is CB that we measure. And we'll feed this back to my set point. Now my regular process has that error going into the feedback controller G and we take some manipulated variable action. Now, over here is my disturbance. And my disturbance would come in. And my disturbance, if left unchecked, goes through a transfer function which we call GD. And that disturbance then will impact my control variable. <coughs> Now my control variable is normally affected by the process transfer function, which we call the GP. And GP has the manipulated variable coming in over here. What the feedback feedforward controller does is, these lines don't lead up quite exactly what I want them to, but a feedforward controller says, let's take this disturbance, let's measure it, and put it through a block which we call GFF. So that feed forward signal, this disturbance is measured, we take some, some action relative to that disturbance, and what we end up doing is we take the regular feedback controller's manipulated variable, and we're going to add some additional amount to it, and this then becomes my manipulated so that's where the feed forward block sits 
relative to the feedback. It's important to understand that you don't get the full picture from this diagram over here. The key thing I want to emphasize is that we're taking our disturbance and we actually measure it. So that implies we put a sensor on whatever that disturbance variable is. If it's a temperature, we have to put in an extra thermocouple to measure that disturbance. If it's a pressure disturbance or a flow disturbance, we put those types of sensors on that stream to measure that disturbance. That disturbance then goes into this new block, which we're going to call GFF, and we're going to derive that on, uh, on Wednesday, what GFF looks like. And I'll show it to you now quickly before the class ends. GFF then is a transfer function that's going to give us an output, and we're going to add that output to whatever our regular feedback controls MV was. So here's my regular feedback controllers manipulated variable. This drawing shows that we simply add some more feedback, add some more change, sorry, not more feedback, we add some more manipulated variable input so that we counteract that disturbance. Everyone clear on, on where this sits conceptually? Okay, good. So let's take a look then. If we're going to try and derive this, what is, so what is G? That's the effect of the disturbance on the system. On the system, exactly. So if we go back to this example, G D is the effect of temperature T1 onto T2. So T1 drops, T2 drops, it tells you how long it takes, the time delay, and the dynamics from T1 to T2. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll simply leave this up here. We'll work through this mathematics on Wednesday's class. But essentially, GFF is the ratio of your disturbance transfer function and your process transfer function, the negative sign. And we're going to see what, how we interpret that and what that means. Okay.